Okay, uh, if there's people outside, we'd like to get everyone in uh, so we can get going. I hope we were able to fit everyone in the room. If, if not, if there's problems, there's an overflow room uh, downstairs. Um, my name is Dave Rajeski, and I direct the Synthetic Biology Project here at the Wilson Center. Um, welcome to everyone. Welcome to uh, Jason Bob, who co-directs or co-founded co the uh, Do-It-Yourself Biology Movement, and Ed Yu from the FBI, from the Weapons of Mass Destruction Directorate. So I think it's <clears throat> just from the beginning, from the panel composition, it's going to be an interesting talk. Um, those of you who have been at some of the earlier discussions we've had, we, we did two of them on um, intellectual property. And I think if, if you go back and we, we, I listened to the tapes again, there, there was this kind of interesting uh, tension between two models of, of ownership. One of them was the um, kind of we created and we own it model that we've seen and we know well in biotech. And the other one is the kind of let's throw a lot of collaborative brain power at big problems and see if we can solve a model. And I think that you know, both of those probably have a place. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, when I was sort of looking at these, I, I, I thought back, and I'm actually old enough to remember being sort of surrounded by computer hackers uh, back in the 70s. Some of you probably are old enough also. And being fed stuff by for friends. By, one of the articles I got, or a bunch of articles, was from a guy by the name of Eric Raymond. The hackers used to call him ESR. And Raymond wrote this wonderful piece uh, called The Cathedral in the Bazaar. And, and basically the premise was we, we used to think that in order to solve really big problems in the software realm, we had to build cathedrals, uh, put a lot of geniuses inside the walls that had PhDs, uh, let them work in splendid isolation, and after a while some beta version would come out. Um, and along came people like Linus Torvald, who worked on Linux and kind of upended the model and said, you know, we can actually do this on the fly. We can share almost promiscuously. Uh, we can correct problems as we go along. Uh, and, and Eric called this the bizarre model. So the idea there was that the co-developers would become the debuggers, uh, and that role could change. Um, that basically we could parallelize debugging and beta testing. Um, that I think it was an early proof that creative problem solving was scalable in large networks. And the other surprise that came out of it was that people will work for praise. Uh, that we, in communities, we can actually set up uh, social reward systems that will get people to do amazing things for very, very little or no money. Um, so when I was thinking about synthetic bio, I was thinking about whether these metaphors and analogies actually work. Uh, whether we have a cathedral and a bazaar or some hybrid. But if you play around with those models in your mind, I think it leads you down very different paths for biosecurity. Um, I'm not sure exactly what, where the end goals are, but I, I think they have huge implications. Um, so one of the things we're going to do, I hope, today is kind of play and tease out some of these models and what they might mean. Um, Jason is going to go first and give you a sense of, of the do-it-yourself biology movement. Uh, if you haven't heard about it, I think it's, it's quite amazing. But it is based on this idea of setting up a collaborative commons uh, where people are empowered to create and share. Um, and Ed will, will, will talk a little bit about how they're beginning to look at sort of this evolving sort of issues and, and challenges in, in biosecurity. So we're going to do both of these end to end. Uh, we're then going to open up to questions. We, we're going to run an experiment because there's a lot of people, uh, we think, watching this from overseas and around the country. Uh, so anybody that's on the webcast, there'll be a link there that you can click on and send us a question via email, which if the technology works, it'll end up here, and I can convey it to either Jason or Ed or both of them. So Jason? Sure. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, everybody can hear me okay, and the audio guy, thumbs up, yep. Um, so today I'm going to, I don't know how many of you, has everybody in the room heard of DIY Bio, or, or we have uh, mostly, yeah? So I'm going to walk you through, we're about two years in as a community, as a group, as a movement, and as a label, because DIY Bio isn't really uh, any one of those things, it's become all of those things in different areas. And I'm going to put a framework around what I think I see DIY Bio is, what the types of people are um, who are involved in DIY Bio and the types of, types of activities that people are doing, and then try to do my best to talk about a few short-term scenarios for the future, and think about 
uh, towards the end, how do we build positive cultures around these new technologies and, um, and become good bio-citizens and what is bio-citizenship and things like that. So um, this is, here's my clicker. This is actually a new image. There are DIY posters being made, and this is courtesy of Matt Cowell. Um, first, I just want to say two minutes or, or 20 seconds about a my background and, and where I spend most of my life and uh, currently, which is working with George Church at Harvard Medical School on something called the Personal Genome Project. And uh, I am a synthetic biology newbie and more of a synthetic biology anthropologist than an, a hacker or a PhD scientist, which I'm not. Uh, I'm really interested in the diffusion of innovation and technologies, and I'm getting a front row seat in how these, the adoption of these technologies is happening through this research study where we are enrolling 100,000 people who are comfortable putting their complete genome and medical histories and trait information on the web into a commons so that we can do systems biology, systems biology level research and look at all aspects of a human holistically from facial photographs to genomes to expression analysis to environmental history, behaviors, so that we can understand how gen genomes plus environments combine to form human traits. And what I've been seeing as part of that project, the reason why that's possible, uh, recall that the Human Genome Project, it cost about three billion dollars and 15 years to do, to, to generate the first draft of a human genome sequence. And just this past December, a company called Complete Genomics published a paper, uh, Nature of Science, I can't remember which one now. Uh, and that's the point in this graph, this thing of a laser on it, uh, up here. Complete genomics, so they they could do a 30x genome, 98% 30x coverage genome sequence for, you know, an average of $4,000 in reagents cost. So we've come down, you know, several million fold in cost since 2003. And the story that that provides, I think, is generally applicable to other technologies in biology, and that we're seeing that these technologies are are becoming more powerful and less costly at a rate that's um, commensurable with Moore's law or even faster. That like in the case of genome sequencing technologies, that the throughput and the rates and, and the um, economic uh, sort of impact of these or, or the cost effectiveness of these instruments is doubling every six months to nine months um, as opposed to 18 months for Moore's law and, and computer chips. And for me, this is in terms of doing exploratory biology. I'm going to talk a little bit about exploratory biology and, and how you can think about the world of how I see the world of DIY bio and non-institutional amateur biotechnology. But we've seen this coming for a long time. Um, this was, you, I don't think you, you can no longer actually purchase these, but this was a, a kit, you know, for, that you could buy for children for, you know, your first DNA sequencer. When in fact, this is, these, this, this is really happening. Um, so just last week, this, this bottom image here is a $50,000 desktop sequencing instrument that was just announced um, in last week um, at a major biology conference. And the one above it is by Roche 454, and this is a desktop sequencing instrument um, which produces about 35, 35 million base pairs uh, you know, in an eight hour run or something approximate like that. These are not yet consumer toys. Um, but they will be soon, and I fully expect for devices like this to be in people's garages. Uh, if you want to actually know the strain of heirloom tomato that you're growing in your garden, uh, you can explore that yourself. If you want to understand the bacteria that are in your dog's mouth, and, and if you share any of those bacteria, um, which you may, uh, you can actually address those questions. If you, want to, uh, you know, if you want to be a species hunter and identify new species that exist out in, in your backyard, then you can do that. Um, and so these, the, the ability of individuals to, to access these technologies at this level is really a novel and exciting development in history. Um, and that is related to the, really, the origin of DIY bio is the recognition of this fact. On the other hand, 
Uh, and so I should just say a few more points about what, what, what I think can be called bio-natives. You've probably seen the book by Don Tapscott, um, Growing Up Digital, and this is the idea that this was the first generation of children who they, they, they can't remember a day that when they didn't have an email address or didn't have a cell phone or didn't have a laptop computer. Um, we are people who have, are now growing up completely immersed in a digital world and they have completely new vocabularies, they have completely new skills. Everybody to some degree is now a computer expert. In biology, we're not quite yet at, so those are the digital natives. Those are people who are completely familiar with digital technologies and the biological natives, I think we're close to having the first generation of people who are biologically literate in completely new ways. And I'm just gonna give a couple examples of that in terms of where are we in history with biological literacy. This was all the way back in 2005, which at the front edges of technology, that's like a century ago. Um, a 15 year old, or is it 18? I think it's 15, yeah, 15 year old. Uh, he, he knew that he was conceived through anonymous sperm donor, through an anonymous sperm donor, and he had two or three pieces of information about this person. A first name, a city of birth, and I think the year of birth. And this 15 year old was able to cobble together technologies on his own to do basically DIY forensics. And so he uh, used a $300 or several hundred dollar genetic genealogy test, got some information back about his genome, went and put this on, paid for a service, a genealogy service, and was able to find three candidates for who is his father, when it turned out one was the brother of his father, and through that person found his anonymous brother donor father. Um, this is one of my favorite stories of, of, of recent, and we're gonna see a whole lot more of this. This is a follow-up. These are high school students in New York City um, who are starting to use these DNA sequencing technologies to do new things. Last year, students at the same uh, high school in New York City went out and collected pieces of sushi from restaurants and grocery stores in the New York City area and then did DNA sequencing or genotyping on those samples and determined that you know, something like 35% of foods are mislabeled, that when you think you're getting red snapper, you're actually getting you know, tilapia with food color or something. Um, and this is the, uh, the second year that this high school has students doing this, and one of their one of my favorite findings is that they bought some Russian caviar, sturgeon caviar, and found that it was actually Mississippi paddlefish, um, <laughs> a completely different creature. Um, and then this is a teenager who had been dealing with a chronic illness for eight years, which uh, had been had gone undiagnosed, and so she requested her pathology slides and took them to her high school science lab, used their facilities there, a microscope, and diagnosed herself accurately with a medical condition and said, hey, I actually think I have this. I found this granuloma on my slide uh, and turned out that she basically self-diagnosed herself through do-it-yourself methods. Um, so I think that biological literacy is pretty clearly on the, in uh, on, on the rise and people are doing uh, entirely new things. And with that in mind, two years ago, I met um, Mackenzie Cowell in Boston. And I'm really interested in uh, doing exploratory biology and finding new projects for individuals um, to participate in science and make discoveries in some way. And Mac, with a background in um, iGEM um, and a, a real enthusiast of synthetic biology and genetic engineering, biological engineering, uh, we felt like that we together that we could start to build a community of find other people who share common interest and build a community of resources for people who want to do biology and do it well. And this slide is a little bit out of date but we're now uh, two years in. The, the, I guess the two year anniversary is coming up this month. Um, our first meeting was April at Asgard's pub in, in, in Cambridge, and a, something like 50 people showed up. 
and we started doing very simple activities and having workshops. And the first things that we did were to extract DNA from strawberries, things like that. Um, build our own gel electrophoresis kits and put bat uh, you know nine volt batteries in series and do you know gel electrophoresis. And this started getting picked up and uh, got picked up in the press a couple of times. And our small community of participants went from you know a f handful of people in Boston to a thousand people a year later, and now it's two year two years later, and we have about two thousand active people. And uh, this is a map of people who are signed up on our map of saying, hey, I'm looking for other people who want to do DIY bio, um, and they're forming regional groups. And so we have really active regional groups in many cities in the United States now, New York City, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Boston, Seattle, and these are people who get together and uh, conduct, you know, it's part social, meeting other people, talking about ideas, and then part workshop-based of, hey, I want to uh, show you how to take a webcam and uh, convert it into a microscope. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the projects that people are working on right now. But first, I figured I, I would let you know that two years in, these are what I think it's, uh, that we've identified as the seven archetypes of DIY bio. Um, bio entrepreneurs, uh, as you'll see in a few minutes, there is a lot of entrepreneurial activity. Uh, a lot of people who are starting companies and doing different things, and they're small companies out of, out of the garage, and often they're open source companies, and they're and they're um, looking at products that may cost five hundred dollars, and say, hey, I can do that for a hundred bucks, and you know, sell it on a website. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about um, some of those pr uh, projects. Another one is uh, investors. We're starting to see investors show up who want to who want to start incubators to develop products. Um, uh, brilliant biohackers and biocurious amateurs and hobbyists. Uh, this is really, I think, a lot of the core of the group. And there are a lot of people who are really interested in doing biology but have no skills, no knowledge, and are just really interested. They've heard about it. They've, they've read stories of iGEM, the Genetically Engineer, Engineer Machines competition at MIT, of the ability of undergraduates to put together parts and make amazing new things like vaccines and, and bacteria that smell like you know, bananas and things like that, and say, hey, cool, I want to do that. How do I do that? How do I get involved? Uh, the Brilliant Biohackers, uh, it's a much smaller number of people who are not just interested in doing it, but actively actually doing biology and assembling laboratories and buying instruments and buying reagents and trying to figure out um, cool projects to do. And I'm going to talk a, a few about those. Artists, artists are usually the first people. Uh, in any new type of movement, and the same is true for uh, DIY bio, and amateur, uh, artists have been involved in doing biology for a very long time, and the same is true here. Uh, moonlighters, there are actually a lot of professional scientists who have interests that they can't pursue in their professional setting and are strong contributors and knowledge also on our online forums. Educators. There are a lot of people who are interested in making biology more accessible to more people in a very general sense, from high school students to developing new products for the, you know, uh, communities in developing countries that don't have access to these technologies or to information, um, and policy folks. Um, a lot of the people, obviously, are, want, to, want to understand how the diffusion of innovation uh, is going to be impacted are going to impact the way that we bear relationship with these technologies as a society over a long term, and I think it's probably why many of you are here. So the scope of activities, I like, and this is what I see people doing right now, uh, divided really into two worlds, the exploratory side and the constructive side. And the exploratory side is just, you know, who else lives here and who are they? Uh, and those being, you know, bacteria and unidentified plants and um, also personal biomonitoring. This is the, 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 the picture here is Kay Ohl, who she uh, is, a, is a nerd and an amazing nerd. And she has a family history of hemochromatosis. And rather than go buy a test for HFE, which you can online for $250, she said, why don't I just genie top myself? And so she bought the equipment and has a closet lab where she started to do this. And this is images of her doing that. And you know, she, of course, would go, any findings, she would go confirm them through a physician or something. But um, now that it's possible to do it, why not? And I think that's the attitude that we're, we're seeing with people. 
um, often in the middle of kits. You're gonna, I think this is one area that you're going to see a lot more activity of, of, of it's sort of chemistry sets that have been reorganized into biological kits. And this is um, uh, the Hello World kit that everybody wants to do is inserting a jellyfish gene into E. coli, incubating it in your armpit for eight hours, and then seeing if it glows. Um, and, and then we're starting to see the very early stages. I say armpit because it's low cost. Incubators cost money. <laughs> Uh, the other way that you can do it is actually just tape it to your computer monitor, which is quite warm. Uh, so you take a tube, you know, tape it to your TV, leave it on for eight hours, and uh, it's a lot cheaper than buying a several thousand dollar incubator. Uh, and then we're starting to see people do more complicated and complex stuff. And it's still, you know, we have, you know, one or two examples of people who have grand ideas of, uh, of, of uh, curing diseases and using. Uh, taking a lead from competitions like iGEM and saying, hey, I want to develop a sensor that can, uh, a biological sensor that can detect arsenic in, in wells also. Or I want, to, I want to do the same thing that's being done in these universities. Um, and this is in the brilliant biohacker category of, of individuals, uh, a, computer, a person with a computer science background. Uh, and then I'm going to walk through hardware, wet, software, wetware are categories that span both constructive biology and exploratory biology, and those aren't, those are very soft categories because, for example, the, this thing that she's working on is senses melamine, uh, the contaminant in, from, from China that was in milk, um, and so that's actually doing environmental sensing but applying genetic engineering to do environmental sensing. So a few more quick examples. Uh, um, how am I doing on time? A few, a few more minutes? Yeah, five, or six. five or six? Okay. So DIY Bio New York City, uh, they're forming a nonprofit to do education. And they want to do workshops for individuals who are interested in, in doing the Hello World, that they, that they read about genetic engineering, and they've read about um, the ability to, to do cool things, make bacteria smell like bananas or menthol or whatever. Um, or they're just artists who want to get involved in new media. Um, and there's actually uh, an artist here in the group, and there's a sci PhD scientist, um, and and they're really thoughtful. They do a lot of introspective pieces. One of the the main leaders of the DOI Bio group is a journalist for National Geographic who wrote an article called "Am I a Biohazard?" And they had a workshop where they bought this kit intended for high school students, where they you know insert the jellyfish gene into the E. coli and it glows. And he recounts the story here. Uh, and ask the question on a long-term basis, you know, what are the things that we need to be thinking about? Uh, and just reflective about the growth of DOI Bio in New York City. And they recently had a workshop where they invited, the, you know, public health officials and firemen and, you know, New York City officers and said, hey, look, there's this space that we have that we do experiments and we want to let you know about it and ask, you know, answer any questions that you have, um, you know, in case there's a fire next door and you walk in here and you see a biology lab. Um, that may make you feel awkward, so we want to let you know in advance. <laughs> uh, 3D printing. This is this is uh, I, these are just some examples of things that are that are popular right now. This is a, a really amazing contributor to DIY Bio that is prolific. Uh, I think he's based in Ireland, and he centrifuges are expensive, and so he actually used 3D printer to develop uh, a Dremel fuge. Uh, you know the Dremel, it's like an electric screwdriver type thing to sand down. Uh, and so he built, uh, he, he had a, the 3D printer, he built a, basically a CAD file that a 3D printer can use to print for $30 a very cheap centrifuge that you can fit tubes into, attach it to an electric screwdriver, and now you have a centrifuge that can generate, you know, I don't I forget how many Gs, a couple, you know, hundreds of Gs of force. Um, this just got funded this week. This is crowdsource innovation. So they raised uh, $6,500 from people all over the world. And this is two individuals who want to enable pocket PCR. And so this device here, uh, they expect to take it to market and cost, you know, I don't know, 100 bucks or a couple hundred bucks and, and uh, to be used in places where you need on-site DNA amplification. And it's... And so they uh, just got accepted into this incubator to turn this into a business, basically. And this is one person is um, Guido is uh, from Venezuela, and the other one is from San Francisco Bay Area, and they're collaborating on this company. 
So global scope. This is a picture of a garage lab, of what it looks like. This is a company of a PhD student and then another engineer who does robotics, and they're interested uh, in curing cancer. <laughs> and I don't know really the details of what it is that they're working on. Uh, I've met them recently, and they have a website, and they're raising money, and they don't intend to be in their garage for very long. They want, just like any other business, to ultimately have their own space and um, uh, in, in, a, in a real business, but this was a way to bootstrap their company for the time being. And this is not anything that's that new. There's a great story of Molecular Probes, which was bought a few years ago for $700 million, where the individual started that in his kitchen um, and actually bottled the first you know, fluorescent chemicals and, and baby and Gerber baby food bottles. Um, and I think we're seeing more of that now um, that's at least public. I think it's been going private for quite some time, and, and many professional scientists have uh, or some, I don't know, many, I don't know what the percentage, you know, do work at home as well. Uh, another biotech company, this is open source gel electrophoresis box, you know, typically you might pay four or five hundred dollars, and there's an entrepreneur, Tito, in, in San Francisco, who said, hey, I can make that for two hundred bucks. Um, and so he did, and he sells it online now. Ten dollar microscope, this is the hardware side, so workshops on how do you take a webcam, uh, turn it into a microscope. Uh, just an example of where we are. Mac, uh, co-founder of DIY Bio. So he recently got at an auction a mobile bio lab for a company that went out of business that these things retailed for, I think, $250,000. And he got it for a steal. You know, uh, I, don't, I don't remember exactly what it was. I think $10,000 maybe. Um, and so you can see the inside of it, fully equipped. Got a lot of equipment at auction. And his plan is to drive this mobile bio lab to different cities around the United States and educate um, high school students and people who want to do learn basic biological techniques how to do it. Um, I, I think the, 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 the average budget of a high school science classroom uh, for the entire high school is on average $4,500 or $5,000. It's not a whole lot of money. And so you're probably not going to get uh, a lot of good equipment in every high school in America. So maybe you put a couple of these things um, together and move them around. And I think that's, um, that's uh, a pretty exciting project. Possible futures. We're starting to see some of these. And um, there are a lot of open questions. We're not exactly sure where this phenomenon is going to go. And it's not the only organization. There are a handful of other uh, loose net communities on the web where people get resources and share resources. We, uh, the community of DIY Bio, I think has, has, has been really, has been pretty successful. Um, but there are others um, that I don't know a whole lot about, but they're out there. And I think they're going to, we're starting to see fusions of different communities like the maker community and the Dorkbot community. Uh, a lot of people who, um, they're sort of new versions of clay potters who get together and, and consolidate around expensive kilns in one place or woodworkers who, who share expensive woodworking equipment. We're going to start to see that around biological um, equipment, and there's going to be a network of community labs, much like this bio lab, much like the lab in New York City. There's another lab in San Francisco called BioCurious, where they want to start uh, having educational workshops. I think it's a great name. Uh, distributed biosurveillance. Um, there's a project that I'm really fond of that I think is an interface for the security. Bio, and when thinking about biosecurity, an interface for it is uh, what if biosecurity isn't centralized? What if biosecurity is actually decentralized? And once these technologies are in the hands of individuals who are able to survey, um, it's sort of like imagine if, if the um, EPA were decentralized and everybody had the ability to evaluate the quality of their tap water the, the quality of their food source, that we're getting closer and closer to that point, and the same goes for biosurveillance. And um, so I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But a cottage industry, I'm fa fairly confident that with the number of entrepreneurs and the number of cool products that are coming out and cool toys, really, for people, um, that we're going to start seeing a lot more activity, even a, co a cottage industry, of this becoming a real hobbyist activity. And it's going to be, I think, a point that gets really confused about DOI Bio is that people assume 
that DOI bio is nothing different than institutional biology. It's just happens in the wild, and nobody knows what's going on, and, and nobody knows what they're doing. Uh, but I think institutional science and DOI bio are very different things. And I think DIY bio is what I call lo-fi biology. And it's going to be optimized and look very different than what happens in institutional science in, in, in the following ways. One, if you, can't, if you can't do it for less than 100 bucks or 500 bucks or 1,000 bucks, um, it's probably not going to happen. There, there are going to be a few maybe big community labs or incubators that set up that, that, that get, have more advanced technology and allow people to do more complicated things, but I see DIY bio optimizing for low complexity, low cost, and low waste. You know, in San Francisco, we have three bins. We have the green bin, the black bin, and the blue bin. The green bin for compost and the blue bin for recycling and the black bin for trash. There is no, you know, red bin for biohazard materials. And so dis disposal is something that's quite expensive for some of those things. And we, you know, we can't go through a thousand pipe, pipe the, in, the average individual may not be able to go through a thousand pipette tips or afford an autoclave in their home uh, for doing different things. And so I think we're going to see those forces come to play and that DIY bio may turn out to be less about contributing, doing real you know, biological engineering that develops vaccines and and uh, you know, takes CO two in the air and converts plastics and you, you know, you know, does things like that, and maybe more fun and toys for a long time, and low complexity things. I'm not really sure. I think that uh, one of the things that you'll see first is uh, DIY gem. Uh, this is the concept of taking iGem but uh, having non-institutional actors, and how that those relationships get worked out. If whether or not people like the Registry for Biological Parts and iGEM, what are the conditions under which, it's unclear what are the conditions under which they would allow non-institutional or amateur biologists participate in their programs. You know, do they need to follow, do they need to verify that they've met certain safety requirements that, that you know, I don't know what those requirements are yet. And then of course this is what everybody's interested in. And another thing that is the activity, you know, will DIY bio get involved in synthetic biology? It's certainly one of the most talked about topics on our Google group in an area where people are tremendously excited about getting involved. I think the, the fact is today that uh, people aren't doing genetic engineering like they do in iGEM at that level, and they're not doing synthetic biology yet, but they surely want to. Um, and if science, um, you know, institutional science is successful at really making it easy to engineer uh, biology and to build cool biological machines that do things like sense ar arsenic or at a certain stage of the growth, you know, smell like menthol, there, are, there is going to be a community of people who are going to be interested in getting involved in that and we're going to do that. And this is sort of a prototype of what, you know, that might look, oh, what that might look like. Um, this is uh, the, the Foo Kit that, th these, these are baseball cards at the right that are a mock-up of, of what biological part cards might look like. And on the left is really easy, simple instructions on how to, this is an example of how to take a gene and, and transform, you know, insert it into E. coli, uh, but very simplified. And so I think that it, it looks like, it looks like, um, uh, it looks like a fun activity, and it's, it's, it looks a lot different than what the science, that, the protocols that you see in a traditional scientific lab. And how far away is that? I don't really know. I don't really know. So currently, iGEM, the, uh, as, a, as an example, it's really like the flagship program. I think the, the student teams pay $50,000 to get in. They have professional advisors. They have, they have access to institutional labs, and we're quite a ways from that currently. But there is no doubt that there are a lot of people who are really interested in, as the prices come down, as it gets easier to get involved and get access to some of the, the standard biological parts, that there are going to be a, a large community, I don't know how large of a community if uh, it's going to be, a, but there's going to be a lot of people who are interested in, in, in doing that and possibly have the facilities with such things as, as community labs. And if you haven't looked at it yet or haven't heard of a, a company called TechShop, um, 
this is it's a, a franchise that's sort of like a exercise gym, a fitness club, but instead it's a you know a, a fitness club for your brain, and they focus right now on electronics and mechanical engineering that they go and buy expensive equipment and you pay them sixty dollars a month and they consolidate it and give and they train you on all these equipment and you get access to it and that's coming in the next ten years for biology too and the individuals are going to have access to uh, community labs and so what paradigms can we look to for help in figuring out who gets access to these technologies is it you know anybody who has an interest and I think that's what the discussion that is going to be important for thinking long term about synthetic biology is under what conditions um, do people get access to it right now we're very much at the at the at uh, the backyard you know model rocket kit stage um, but this is an example of a mature hobbyist enthusiast community of high powered rocketry and the things that they can do uh, this was an amateur who worked for, uh, I think, more than a decade on building a, it's the Saturn rocket, uh, a tenth of a scale, and actually had a successful launch that broke many records in uh, Maryland uh, last year, about this, this time last year. And you take that paradigm, and of course, for these, you have to have coordination with the FFA, you have to have license to get you know, these rocket fuels and, and have licensing for high-powered engines. And, and is this, is there any model here for you know amateur synthetic biology in the future maybe uh, another one that's, that I think uh, might be appropriate is uh, scuba diving that it's sort of consumerized the world of, of scuba and open up an entire realm of exposure to obviously the ocean and 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 life down there and explorations of synthetica uh, people have called it you know synthetic biology uh, maybe it looks something like that and that the more advanced that you get the more the more education is required or not. And so I think the, the, the real question that where we've reached, and it's still early in the community of DOI Bio, I mean, there are 2,000 or so participants, but we're starting to see companies emerge and community labs be set up, is how can we promote this concept of biocitizenship in these communities, and how can we create positive cultures around these technologies? And what are the interfaces and where are the areas? Um, I'm really looking to a lot of you, I think there's people here from a lot of diverse backgrounds, are um, help me think about it and um, help me think about how to do this well because you know with or without this organization group label movement DIY bio there is still going to exist tremendous interest in getting involved in biology and DIY bio has I think become a nice link to all sorts of different people that we can share resources and insights and best practices and so the question is, what, what are those best practices? And, what, and, and what's not only uh, from a biosecurity or biosafety point of view, what's important now and what's important in 10 years? Um, I think we're, there's still a lot of work to be done to separate the, the hype and the hope of DOI bio and the hype and the hope of synthetic biology of where we actually are. Um, and so security interfaces, uh, DIY, I just want to close on one more thing, uh, DIY forensics and DIY biosecurity. Uh, I'm actually doing a project right now called the BioWeather Map, and I'm going to be running 50 samples. Um, I'm shipping them on Friday uh, to the lab, and what we're going to do, use next generation sequencing to identify all of the microbes that are living on a dollar bill. If you want to participate, um, take a hundred dollar bill out of your wallet. <laughs> a one dollar bill is fine. Take a one dollar bill out of your wallet, write down the serial number on a piece of paper and keep that because the, the, the data will be available on April 27th as part of something called the GET conference, Genomes, Environments, and Traits. Um, take that dollar bill, fold it into a, a piece of paper, write your name on the piece of paper and give it to me. Don't just hand me a dollar uh, because as soon as I grab it, I put my microbiome all over it and I want it to be yours and the people who touched it before you. Um, and we'll release the data in the public uh, around April 27th. So if you want to participate in that, um, I'd, love, I'd love to collect some samples here. Um, and I think the, 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 the biosecurity uh, implications of distributed environmental sensing uh, are quite obvious, and I think that's going to be a, a good, and Ed's going to talk a little bit about that, with this neighbor, neighborhood watch paradigm uh, for biosecurity. And also, 
Um, from, you know, there's a lot of people here with a lot of different backgrounds, and if there's you know, one thing that you would like to communicate to DIY Bio members, uh, I would love to hear it. Um, and I'd like to collect those and, and share that as an outcome of this research, uh, out, out of this talk with the, uh, the forum, the online forum and the people, and I'll try to collect those. And you can make it anonymous or put your name on it, doesn't matter, but it'd be great if you could share. And that's all I have. Thanks. Chairs, editor. Yeah, oh, sure. All right, good afternoon. Um, First off, I just really want to thank the Widow Wilson Center for hosting this event. I think it's uh, very timely. Uh, the topics are of great interest to a lot of folk, as, as evidenced by the people who are attending today. Um, once again, my name is Ed Yu. I'm with the FBI's uh, WMD Directorate, uh, the Countermeasures Unit on the Bioterrorism Prevention Team. And uh, the topic today is, uh, well, synthetic biology, but with a focus um, on biosecurity, which is uh, actually a, a daunting task, but uh, I'll get into it. First, just a little bit of background. Uh, the FBI's WMD director was founded in uh, 2006, so uh, we were not even four years old yet. But what um, it tried to do is encompass um, many different aspects to make sure that we can uh, detect, deter, and prevent um, uh, WMD threats. Uh, it incorporates countermeasures and preparedness, um, investigative and operations, and intelligence analysis all under one shop. And the team that I'm part of, um, the Bioterrorism Prevention Program, uh, have several objectives, um, as listed here, building national and international bioterrorism threat detection, identification reporting capabilities, improved bioterrorism assessment and investigative capabilities. But um, for today, it's uh, this as aspect that I really want to focus on is enhancing bioterrorism scientific industry and academic outreach. And why is this really important? Well, um, in the context of synthetic biology uh, tackling biosecurity, there are several different challenges. Namely, one is a relevant biosecurity message, and what do I mean by that? Well, first off, when it comes to biology, we are dealing with living organisms that are naturally occurring out in our environment. Um, these are reproducing, um, these are ever-changing, um, so that in itself is a challenge. Um, unlike uh, nuclear or chemical or other fissile materials, you can have a handle on where they're at and who has them. Not so much the case when you're dealing with uh, uh, pathogens that are out there in that environment. And then, as evidenced, um, from Jason's talk is that there, we're dealing with technological and technical advances as well. And he touched on this, um, talking about Moore's Law. I mean, before we were seeing how we were fast forward uh, um, in improving uh, processing power and computer chips, well, now we're at a point where uh, DNA sequencing capabilities is outpacing uh, that. And there's the uh, one aspect of that we have to take into consideration. Um, th this is what the consequences are of that, is uh, here's an a scale of showing exactly how many sequences are being submitted to GenBank, the repository um, for these sequences. Um, it's, ex there, it's exploding, the, the amount of input. And uh, what does that mean? Well, again, Jason touched on this. We're, we're finding, discovering new species, uh, new functions, new factors. And the basic science has to catch up with what we're identifying. Um, with a low cost of sequencing that's now available, we can uh, tap into a lot more that's out there. And what the possibilities are has yet to be addressed. And then, of course, um, you know, we just spent time talking about DIY bio. So the, here's a challenge then. Um, we are also developing, the, the message is, but then we're, de we're dealing with several different communities, meaning that we're on the cutting edge um, technology from the industry side, from academia, and in its own right, from the amateur biologist level, they have their own innovation, their own resourcefulness and advances as well. So under those circumstances, what exactly is biosecurity? And I liken it to this picture. Um, it could mean many different things to many different people. And coming from uh, the D.C. area where we deal with a lot of policy aspects dealing with biosecurity, um, you'll see a lot of buzzwords like dual use, exploitation, proper handling of materials, physical security. And how do we address all of that? Well, 
to put it to um, an amateur biologist perspective, it's and to most in the most cases, it's very simple questions like for dual use, is what I'm doing safe? Um, proper handling materials, is there an impact to health or the environment? Physical security, are my facilities and materials secure? And is my information and the people who are working with, or myself um, safe? And this is another term that we see very often that encompasses all of these aspects. It's um, a culture of responsibility. Now, um, I'll touch on this a little bit later, but uh, I actually attended uh, DIY Bio as one of their first formal conferences and used this very same slide. And uh, one of the attendees actually raised their hand and said, so what the FBI is trying to say is, you want to instill upon the community a neighborhood watch. And I said, well, bingo, that's exactly what we're looking for here. Um, because, again, we are dealing with uh, uh, materials and the quote-unquote know-how that's already out there. Um, and what better way than to get enlist the support of the community members themselves who are actually in the middle of it to, to promote this culture of responsibility to, well, I don't like using the term because it's ironic coming from the FBI, but self-police. Um, so sorry for that. But... <laughs> Here's a stark reality check, though. Um, this just came out a couple months ago, is that uh, you know, there are entities out there that really want to in, um, commit harm against us, um, against the, the people, um, and there is an interest in, expressed interest in bioweapons. And then we have this to deal with. Um, this came out uh, just back, this, uh, back in January that the U.S. government um, report card, well, we got an F, we didn't do very well um, in addressing the bioterrorism threat. What does that mean? Well, the circumstances could be that, say something should go sideways, say there, there is an incident. It doesn't matter whether it's um, within the amateur community or in academia and industry. It could possibly mean legislation and regulation with increased restrictions and more oversight. What's the potential impact? Well. Some of those results could be potentially ill-informed when they're enacted and have a negative impact on research activities. Now, the FBI recognizes that this in itself um, poses a national security threat. If you have restrictions, if you stifle innovation, if you stifle uh, research progress, um, you're inhibiting countermeasure development, you're in your uh, vaccine development. I mean, you, there's a whole slew of consequences by this. So. This is, that is really not a good option. So how do we address this really challenging issue? Well, I want to give you what I consider a success story um, with biosecurity synthetic biology with, with a focus on synthetic genomics. Um, case in point, 1918 influenza pandemic. Um, estimated about 50 million uh, casualties worldwide uh, went extinct. However, in 2005, a, a group resurrected uh, the, this particular virus, um, de novo, uh, resynthesized it, brought it back to life um, using reverse genetics. Well, it's uh, 1918 influenza virus. It's an H1N1 virus, 13,500 nucleotides long. And I looked on the, on the web, and you have a company like Mr. Gene who advertises they can do that for 39, synthesized uh, DNA uh, at 39 cents per base pair which means that you can get 1918 influenza virus for a good price of $5,265, ostensibly. And then in 2006, um, in the UK, uh, a reporter from The Guardian ordered small oligos um, for, from smallpox. Um, these are very, very small, small sequences. Uh, on a threat level, it was really nothing, but it caused a huge sensation. Well, this caused a, uh, was a rather large wake-up call for the synthetic genomics industry. And uh, to their credit, uh, they were very proactive and adjusted their business practices um, to look at what is actually going out the door, who's buying it. And then from the FBI side, we instituted in 2007 um, a synthetic biology tripwire initiative uh, with the goal of how do we prevent um, individuals who have, from acquiring pathogenic sequences who have no legitimate purpose for it. Um, we made initial contacts with several industry members. And... Uh, for the industry, this was a really good uh, recourse for them because uh, if they do their due diligence, there were some occasions where they still needed some assistance. And um, basically, if they came up through their screening procedures, who do they call? And by the FBI stepping in, um, we gave them uh, that outlet. And the 
the the nexus of this all are, are FBI WMD coordinators. Um, these are agents who are trained. Um, they are the liaison between state and local emergency responders, uh, state and local law enforcement, public health. They are the front line. They are where the, boot, uh, the rubber meets the road um, out in the field. Uh, they con conduct, con make contact liaisons and then f report back to headquarters. Um, I want to focus on the fact that that's their main job and that there's at least one of them in all of our 56 field offices. So for the, from the synthetic DNA company's point of view, how the, mod, the tripwire initiative works is that, say uh, there was a, an incident of some kind, well, they will contact their local FBI WMD coordinator, who would then contact um, headquarters, the WMD directorate, where internally, as I had mentioned, we have an operational unit, um, an analytical unit. And on top of that, we have our own internal subject matter experts. Uh, we have hazardous materials response, um, our own CBRN experts and uh, critical incidents response um, uh, assets too. But then the FBI does not work in a vacuum. We also work and develop partnerships with fe other federal agencies. And then by working on this, we can then report back to uh, where the incident occurred originally. And I'll give you a, a case study. Um, there was one company that did receive a, an order from a foreign country. Um, they, they conducted their due diligence and that they were still um, at a crossroads. So they contacted their local WD coordinator who then contacted the headquarters. Um, we conducted our initial assessment and then realized that we needed to bring Department of Commerce on board. Uh, they immediately uh, replied that, you know, based on the, the origin of this order, there were very many export regulations that had to be addressed. And within a very quick turnaround, um, we fed this information back to the company and help them with their business decision. In this instance, the FBI really did act as a resource. Uh, uh, that we have the, uh, the, um, the reputation of kicking down doors and throwing handcuffs on everybody and then asking questions later. But in this instance, we really did act as the mediators, as the facilitators for the information. And then as a result, um, the FBI and, and other federal agencies in partnership, um, which, and this it was spearheaded by the Department of Health and Human Services, recently came out with a screening framework guidance for synthetic DNA providers. And uh, this came out in the Federal Register back in November uh, for public comment. And within this guidance um, were customer screening recommendations, sequence screening recommendations, and then government notification recommendations, which is highlighted um, contacting the FBI WMD coordinators and where necessary the Department of Commerce or the CDC. And I will note that uh, the, the, per the architect of it all is Dr. Jessica Tucker, who's actually sitting out there as well. Um, but in this sense, I'd like to think that this is where we got it right. It, this is voluntary guidance, um, and it basically um, assisted the companies in their already proactive efforts. So uh, why outreach? Well, again, uh, we are looking at a lot of different areas where they're screaming forward into the future. And from a government side, uh, especially from a policy side, uh, it is very difficult to catch up. Well, in regard to synthetic biology, the FBI back in August of last year, we held our first uh, synthetic biology conference um, entitled Building Bridges Around Building Genomes. And we did this in partnership with the Department of Health and Human Services, the State Department, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And in this, at this conference, we brought together uh, representatives from the synthetic biology industry, um, from academia, and from the uh, amateur biologists from DIY Bio. And basically, where, where is the state of the art right now? What are some of the risks that are, um, in, uh, that are associated with this? How can we manage it? And what is the role of the FBI? And we actually brought in several WMD coordinators from various field offices so they can actually have a face-to-face -face meeting with all these different stakeholders. And then as Jason mentioned, um, we have the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition, uh, this undergraduate one. This past year, in 2009, there were 1,200 attendees, 26 countries, 100 universities. Well, for the first time, the FBI um, attended. Uh, we held a uh, biosecurity workshop and manned an outreach uh, booth. And because of the international component, we invited um, the State Department, uh, Dr. Jessica Petrillo there, and also the uh, UN Biological Weapons Convention uh, Implementation Support Unit, uh, Dr. Piers Mullet's in the picture as well, too. Um, basically promoting uh, responsible research uh, and to these, well, I hate to use the word youngsters, but I guess it's appropriate now. But, but bottom line, uh, these are undergraduates, teenagers who within a three to four month turnaround are, you know, 
manipulating at a genetic level uh, bacteria and yeast. And um, to its credit, the iGEM organizers in, in 2009 uh, had the, required the teams to have address the safety component of their projects, meaning what are the potential environmental impact um, if, if their projects had got out to the world. Well, the FBI presence um, in this, this past year uh, led fed into the fact that they, we were re-invited to 2010 and to assist in actually addressing now the, the security component of it as well. So it's, it's making it a well-rounded one. It's the project, the safety, and the security. And then just recently, uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, the DIY bio community, uh, UCLA hosted what the, the Outlaw Biology Conference. And uh, they invited the FBI to come out there and talk about the responsible research. And it was at this event where uh, the DIY bio members said, well, you want to institute a neighborhood watch. And that was, I couldn't have put it more succinctly. And uh, we outlined what the role of the WD coordinators are um, in that context, meaning that um, they are those, a point of contact for, as I mentioned, public health. So uh, we're not dealing with just the criminal aspects, but um, there, you know, there are whole city zoning issues, um, state and uh, uh, local codes that need to be enforced. Well, I'm not saying that we're the one-stop shop, but at least we, are, we have those people on our, uh, those points of contact within those different entities to provide that information. Um, and as I was mentioned, too, that you know, if, if a neighbor had, was driving by and saw an open garage door and saw uh, a laboratory set up there, they're like, oh my gosh, could I have a methamphetamine manufacturing uh, lab next door to me? Well, the way it should work then is that if the call should come into the local law enforcement and then contact FBI, the way it'll work then is the WD coordinator, who is now aware of uh, the DIY bio movement, will say, oh, you know, hey, <laughs> Stand down. You know, we know who these people are. They are, they are a known quantity. And ho hopefully that, that's the way it will work. But then to conclude, there, as I had mentioned, there is a threat out there. Um, and how do we, how do we uh, engage the research community, which combines all the uh, players I had mentioned before, and get them engaged on, on addressing that, that threat? Well, what the role of the FBI is, you know, it is our job to address that threat. But with that, it is our responsibility to communicate um, the risks to the research community, to get them under to understand what the real world situation is, to educate them, to give them the situational awareness. But this is not a one way street. We need to rely on the on those community members to report back to us, not just the suspicious activity that, that normally comes with a neighborhood watch, but we absolutely depend upon them that they are on the cutting edge. They're the leading edge of all of the activities, the techniques, the technologies. They're in a position to say, you need to realign your resources. Why are you looking at that? That's not a risk. Here's where the real risk is. And help us realign where our, our um, resources are targeting uh, and mitigating the risk. And then that way that helps us realign and make sure that we are effectively addressing the threat. So mitigating the risks, conducting the outreach, building the partnerships that are absolutely necessary, and then having the information sharing so that making sure that both um, at the law enforcement policy level, um, for industry, academia, and the am amateurs that we're all communicating, all addressing, and all managing that risk. So to that end, yeah, we're from the FBI, and we are definitely from the U.S. government, and we're here to help. <laughs> really. <laughs> really. But we, and we do absolutely need you. So thank you very much. Okay, we've got some time. We'll open it up for questions. Uh, please raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you um, and just tell us who you are, and then you can start. We want to make sure the people that are watching via webcast can, can hear you. Yep, right in the front. So one of the first questions. Wait a second. Let me just let get you the mic. <clears throat> Nobody's ever accused me of needing one before. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, many of you already know me. <laughs> yeah. um, so one of the first questions that you asked was um, about the intellectual property paradigm and, in addition, how uh, people are collaborating in new ways. And don't believe for a second that the do-it-yourself biology movement is lost on industry 
or on their ideas about intellectual property. Even uh, George Whitesides and Paul Yeager, who are working on diagnostics for the third world that they expect to be free, patent their work. And why? Freedom to operate. Not because they're looking for profit. So there's another motive there that was not one of the two that you mentioned. Um, and as far as the collaborative diaspora, uh, the industries are all using it. All biotech companies launch prototype instruments. That's the way it works today. They launch a prototype instrument that doesn't work very well. They <clears throat> foist it on their customers. Their customers attack it and figure out how to use it out in the diaspora, dramatically improve it. Almost all of the big improvements in the first two years of the ultra-high throughput sequencing instruments were done by just folks out in labs, figuring it out and bringing that information back to the companies to help them improve their products. So the whole concept is both at the professional laboratory level operating in industry and down at the DIY bio side of it. And they're parallel sorts of things. One of the really neat DIY um, examples is uh, uh, Nathan Wolf and Joseph Fair's company, the Global Viral Field Initiative, mm -hmm. where they go out and collect samples on the basis of free cell phones that they give out that allow a text message for collecting samples. Yeah, I should also say that that's an example of citizen science. They train yes. uh, locals. locals on how to collect samples and turn them into the scientists, the people who know the territory, the people who are actually going out and hunting animals, and they say, while you hunt them, why don't you get a blood drop and put it on this card and send it to me? <laughs> and they do. Yep. But I should also say... Um, I'm not sure about the intellectual property. Um, I don't think it's entirely ideologically open source either. Um, there are certainly a lot of strong advocates for open source, and which is true in institutional biology too. There are some who believe, you know, with strong intellectual property rights, synthetic biology is not possible because it's like, a computer system you know there are a thousand parts in a computer and if everybody wants five percent then a personal computer may cost hundred and fifty thousand dollars right and you can never get it down to a thousand dollars and if you want to build biological instruments or biological machines and there are a thousand components in it, everybody wants five percent then it's impossible um, and there are examples already where the intellectual property to actually get patents and the legal processes around that cost more than the actual R&D cost for certain things. So, but there, there definitely is a very strong flavor of open source and um, for all sorts of things in DIY bio, but also with entrepreneurs and investors around. And um, it's not always clear to me that um, open source is going to be the way that, that, DIY bio goes. I'm sure there's going to be lots of patents, and White Size is a great example. He just actually got the patent from Harvard for his low cost paper diagnostics uh, given back to him from Harvard and said, or licensed back to him so he could do it cheaply. Um, yeah, right here. Uh, this is for uh, Edward Yu. Uh, bottom line, is the FBI worried that uh, some lone wolf or maybe someone part of a large organization will take some of this technology that we've seen as can be acquired relatively easily, given that you say it's at the equivalent of a you know, backward uh, rocket uh, <laughs> level at the moment? Are, are, is the FBI worried that... Uh, someone could take some of this technology and use it for nefarious purposes. Right. Well, as um, evidenced by the presentations, um, you know, we're, we're looking at um, advances in technologies. Um, so that barrier to, do, into, to entry to do um, nefarious acts to even just cause mischief is getting lower and lower and lower. So that risk is growing. So um, with anything, um, when, you, when you have ease of access um, 
And again, with, with biology, it's a different animal because um, as far as we're concerned, the, the genie's already out of the bottle because again, these things are uh, dealing, we're dealing with organisms that are already naturally occurring in the environment. Um, these are techniques that have been um, out there already. I mean, we're looking at decades of, uh, of uh, recombinant DNA uh, techniques, but the difference that we're seeing now with the dawn of synthetic biology is that the techniques um, are getting easier. So um, that is something that we have to address, and we're trying to do that proactively now by engaging the communities. Yep. Right here. Hi, I'm Dana Perkins with the Department of Health and Human Services, and and this is for for Jason. And I I uh, I told you this in another occasion. I think DIY bio has a PR problem mm -hmm. and an image. Pro problem. Um, you're talking about, um, you know, all the the nice articles in the New Scientist or whatever articles about the Y bio and about the, uh, uh, you know, the the achievements of the members. Uh, you know, the, the the police patrol in the neighborhood. They may not read New Scientist, but they may read USA Today or Washington Post about the Y bio art press articles that are called. Um, zombies, rabies, and synthetic genomics, right? Yeah. I mean, and I, you know, the title says it all, yeah. right? So, but, so, you know, that's why it's important to do outreach in your neighborhood, too, and, you know, not only what it starts from the top down, from the FBI to DIY bio, but from the DIY bio uh, members in their local communities as well. Yeah. Um, and, um, and also it's a it's a matter of the the the, the messages that DIY bio um, um, is uh, presenting in their outreach events mm -hmm. and even though I will give you one dollar for that <laughs> bio surveillance project <laughs> um, you know um, in terms of all the concerns that exist about the uh, dual use potential of the of the group um, you know, people will be interested, and actually, I would like to hear the answer to this. Mm -hmm. For instance, um, if you will find from the one-dollar bills that you got from different people, if you will find uh, Brucella, Tularemia, bacteria, what other select agents, uh, um, you know, part of uh, um, uh, the bacterial uh, load you on those uh, on those bills. What are you going to do? I mean, knowing the regulations that those are select agents for which, you mm -hmm. know, you may require a license. Uh, uh, you know, this kind of message will show good citizenship, that you not only thought about the benefits to the science, but also yep. uh, some security implications. So the PR problem, part of the, it's a, it's a, difficult issue so from the very beginning we actually try to avoid the word biohacker and because of the negative connotations that many see in hacking so in in most in communities of hackers hacking is a good thing and everybody else it's a scary thing when your computer gets hacked into it's usually not voluntarily uh, done to you it's you know somebody is trying to intrude and do something malicious and so biohackers is a really loaded term. And when, in fact, the very first Boston Globe article came out, it used the word biohacker. And my girlfriend's parents um, sat me down and were like, ah, we didn't know you were a biohacker. You know? <laughs> 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 Which goes to show how powerful words can be. And it's really not clear what the right answer for with DIY bio because people will believe what they want to believe. And no matter, and we would, as a policy, talk to anybody who wanted to talk to us. And so we would answer the call, and when journalists said, hey, I want to hear about DIY Bio, we'd tell them about it, and then they would go, right, people are creating zombies in their basements, you know? Um, and so I don't really know. It's a really tough issue. So we, for a while, just quit talking to press, because obviously our outreach efforts were not working. <laughs> uh, but the, the, other th the other thing is, you know, where, in fact, over a long, you know, on the long-term basis, there are real discussions that need to be had about you know biosecurity. I think the most pressing issue right now is just biosafety and people who want to um, people who will start actually having organisms um, smaller. You know, typically you know they have dogs and cats, but when they start collecting 
you know, microorganisms as pets as well. Um, what is the appropriate use and disposal of those organisms uh, and reagents and, and, you know, the proliferation of people actually doing experimentation? What do we do with those? And so biosafety is really item number one. On a long-term basis, there needs to be a societal discussion. Um, I view... I view it almost as a permission thing. I would love to get permission from society to do this. I know I'll never, I know that it really is impossible. There are people who really dislike the idea of professional scientists doing synthetic biology. So going and asking, hey, can I'm an amateur, can I do this in my garage? I know the answer is gonna be no from a lot of people. Um, but at the same time, I think the discussion needs to be real and how to have that discussion and raise awareness about the issues to come up with smart, sensible solutions um, you're still talking about bad things and the potential for bad things. And people would much prefer to descend upon those and to talk about those things um, rather than talk about the new business that was formed in somebody's garage for a $100 PCR machine that can be used in high school biology labs. It's just not quite as sexy. So I don't know. I, I would love advice um, on how to both have a social, a thoughtful social conversation about the issues uh, at the same time without, by doing that, devastating the community that we're trying to build and to have that discussion. So I don't know what the answer is. And just before we, I'll continue that, but we, we did have a question that came on in from the, the Pentagon, which I'll <laughs> address to you. It, well, it's a good segue actually into this question. Uh, the question is, do you implement or utilize any advisory or safety committees, DYI, bio? And the, the follow-up was, how do you ensure that genetically modified microbes wouldn't make it into the environment? So um, there are one of the areas that I think this a lot touches on biosafety. And a lot of the regulations that are out there for scientists who do biology and work with organisms or depend on scientists who get NH funding need to follow these guidelines. And those guidelines uh, are intended for an entirely different audience. And if you were just to change the name from, um, you know, change the titles of, of those documents, those regulations, and say, now those apply to everybody else um, and, and, and do a control F and replace, on the entire document for institutional to amateur science, it's just not going to work. Um, and we're right now working, there are all sorts of existing regulations that amateurs sort of run into by accident uh, when they're trying to acquire equipment or they're trying to acquire reagents. There are a lot of companies that don't actually ship the home addresses, they only ship the business addresses. And so people set up companies and now, now they're not an amateur, they're a company. Um, and, and it gets really complicated for people to have access to these technologies, um, more complicated than it needs to be. And so I think what is needed most for some of the concerns from the person from the Pentagon are easily exportable, uh, you know, a pre-flight checklist for how do you, how do you, what is, what is biosafety and how do you actually be safe and what is proper disposal and those should be written in, an, in, a, in a language that, an under, that is useful not just to um, blo not just to relieve the concerns of the Pentagon person but to actually be useful in practice to an amateur because what DOI bio is is access to all of the people who are actually doing these things in in the world, and I, these things are also these activities are going to be transported around the globe. And the sooner that we can pr get together valuable educational resources for actually ha best practices for how to be safe and how to, if you are interested in, in having, you know, pet microorganisms, what does that mean, and how do you dispose of them, and which ones are okay and which ones aren't. Um, and we're a really, really long ways away from that. It is really difficult. Uh, uh, I think people just muddle through at this point. Uh, oftentimes, reagents and things have information about, like like prescription drug inserts. Mm -hmm. well, some of these kits actually have information about biosafety and disposal, and you know, do you need to autoclave it, and what pressure and what temperature, that kind of thing. Um, but there is no systematic program or infrastructure in place for amateurs like there are for NH NIH-funded researchers. 
So. I got it. Yeah, Don. We'll go to the back here. I'm Don Wolfensberger with the Congress Project here at the Wilson Center. This is for uh, Special Agent Yu. What lessons, if any, uh, has the FBI and the research community, community learned from the anthrax attacks that will enable you to better identify the source for these attacks quicker? I think in this instance um, that the neighborhood watch um, analogy is very appropriate. Um, it's basically engaging um, all the different communities who are, are um, active in, in, you know, who are participating in these activities, you know, who better to um, notice any peculiarities or, or suspicious activity than the people within the communities. And, and I really like the term uh, citizen biologist because it really enforces the fact that, and it, 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 and it feeds into the neighborhood watch, is that you're, you have a duty, a responsibility. So uh, it really does supports that whole notion that, um, you know, we really need to kind of look out for one another within our community. And I think the, the biggest hurdle, too, that, um, and especially from looking at it from the amateur biologist perspective, is for law enforcement entities like the FBI or whomever else, is developing that trust factor so that if, if there is a reportable activity, that are you comfortable in contacting um, uh, entities like the FBI? And hence, that's where, why the outreach is absolutely critical. It's um, educating the, the, uh, the, the communities that there are risks, that there are these um, issues that need to be addressed. But at the same time, and just as I'm sitting next to Jason, I mean, I, I almost feel like I'm joined with him at the hip because we, are, we give these type of presentations a <laughs> lot now. But it's basically putting a face to uh, the, the entity that knowing that I feel comfortable having someone like the FBI WD coordinator on my speed dial. Because um, I understand that the response is going to be commensurate, that they understand um, uh, who I am, where I'm coming from, um, and that the, the notification um, will be assessed and uh, the response will be commensurate. Um, but we can't do that unless we engage the, the various communities. Yeah, we're, oh, let me go way, way back. When the Abrams Global Green USA last year was all about discussing personnel reliability among the um, biomedical community in the uh, D.C. area. Um, my question is, and, and that was personnel reliability, but people who physically are in the same building. Here we talk about 2,000 people in completely different countries and uh, small garages. So my question is, Right now you have these 2,000 people in your group, DIY. So how much do you actually know about these people and what do you know and um, what does FBI know about these people and um, how much information do they share among each other and um, do you look at this as a security issue? Because prior to 9-11 it was very easy to learn how to fly the airplane. And uh, now we have all this community that learn very easily all these skills. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Thank you. Um, so what do we know about community members? It's a, it's a public forum and you can go to and cruise around and see people. Many of them use the real names. People use pseudonyms um, on there, like often people do on the web as well. And we don't. Uh, there's only a certain percentage of a lot of people who are, you know, 2,000 people or so in the online forum. Uh, a lot of those are watchers and readers. Uh, there's only a handful of people who are regular contributors. But it's a really, there's tons of, now we're getting together and having national meetings. There's regional meetings and national meetings, and I meet a lot of the people. And then the people from all walks of life, from professional scientists to uh, complete hobbyists to artists, all kinds. And, and like those seven archetypes, those are archetypes because, you know, we don't know who all of the people are uh, who are on, who are involved in our group. And, and there is no qualification for membership either. Um, if, we've wanted to make this from the beginning 
um, as open to anybody as possible and, and pitch the, the widest tent as we can. I should say that um, we're working on new new technology to make it more akin to you know sort of Facebook level transparency of who people are. We want that because when you're sharing expertise with other people, you want to know just taking random advice from who some pseudonym on the web <laughs> uh, isn't always the best thing. It's amazing what you can get for free when you ask questions on the web. You can get an answer in you know two and a half minutes from somebody who's a real expert. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, oftentimes it's really helpful to have true names. And so one of the very first online communities of the web called The Well um, had an enforcement of you own your own words and you must use your real names because we can't have any serious dialogue unless we don't know who each other are. And um, so we think about those issues from a community point of view of uh, should we enforce real names? Uh, we may exclude a bunch of people that we may want to know about and may want to... Um, have inside of our tent as well, but I don't know. So we don't we don't know who everybody is, and, and also DIY bio is this label that people have start to just apply to their work or their interest. And there are other groups out there um, who are on the web as well. And, and I don't really know how big uh, how big the the movement or is entirely. And. I'll just follow up with that. I mean, that's one of the reasons why um, the FBI had an outreach effort at this past iGEM, um, is that we're instilling that nugget, um, that notion in uh, these teenagers about um, look at the implications, potential implications on their projects, like the safety and the security, so that um, this uh, understanding is being instilled in the next generation of synthetic biologists, of and if they move on to become um, proclaimed uh, DIY bio members, that uh, they have a better understanding of what what are some of the issues that we're concerned of uh, at, as a po at a policy level. And and I'm I'm you bring up the the uh, the flight school uh, um, scenario. Um, wouldn't it have been nice if the fellow students and the instructor? If they had that situational awareness, if they suddenly had a student who only cared about how to fly the plane and not care about landing and taking off, if they had the situational awareness to, you know, I should maybe report this to somebody. Um, that's what we're, we're trying to instill in that neighborhood watch mentality. Yeah. Let, me, let me just uh, uh, do one more question from the, uh, the web that came in from the University of Illinois. Um, the person asked, um, sort of the, the idea of crowdsourcing data on the dollar bills was interesting, but uh, whether you thought about enthusing sort of the larger population with a mission to solve some problem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so you got the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, the uh, NASA click worker project where they had people trying to identify craters. Yeah. Uh, problem solving. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's. Th <laughs> well, there's tons of really cool citizen science. Um, and the bioweather map, the um, the reason why the dollar bill is interesting is because it already has a serial number on it. Like I could ask for a vial of soil from everybody, to, um, uh, but you usually don't have that in your pocket. And uh, it's much easier in giving talks to collect dollar bills and get people involved. But it, that bioweather map becomes a platform for doing all sorts of things, understanding biodiversity and what species live there, and do the ecosystems around us and the microbes that live in the pond in my backyard, does it change over time and why? Ultimately, this is going to transition into DIY public health, too. Um, sending Q-tips of your nose and watching the flu virus move in and out of your body uh, over time, and, and actually having real bioweather maps of seeing different types of things move through your city. Like we have versions of that right now that don't use biology, that just crawl the, the you know health healthmap.org just crawls the web and, and ser searches through newspaper articles for keywords like the flu and then maps them out and you can see the, the, emer the outbreaks uh, of different diseases. And I think we're gonna have real versions of that. Um, and there is no question that um, there are gonna be lots of opportunities to do crowdsource science and um, we originally, when we started DOI Bio, we had the plan to do that. And I can't even remember now what we called it. And the first one was going to be the bioweather map. And like year one, we're going to do bioweather map. Year two, we're going to do something else. And year three, and we're going to have annual crowdsourced competitions for solving some cool problem. And it turned out that 
these projects took just a lot more work than we thought, and, we, and <laughs> uh, as they always do in real life, uh, they take a lot of energy, and we were a little early. It was still, so for each one of those dollar bills, it cost $170 right now uh, to get that data out of there, and we're using next generation sequencing. It's very new technology, or new, you know, new-ish, um, and it's still quite expensive. So I really look forward to uh, doing you know, crowdsourced biology, and we're seeing this already in communities, the most active communities on the web who are doing participatory science is really self-discovery and health. And companies have set up like patients like me, where people want to find out the causes of their own conditions. And so all of the HIV patients and all the ALS patients and all the Parkinson's patients get together and share their, their data about their medications, their drug response, things like that. And wouldn't it be great, you know, for us to set up these same communities around projects that we've started to see in astronomy and um, Galaxy Zoo, for example. But I don't, I don't have any offhand crowdsourced science that are biology projects other than the ones that you already know about that exist, like the annual bird count that's happened for now over 100 years. Um, and uh, other projects like uh, distributing sunflower seeds to people so that you can uh, grow sunflowers and then count the number of bees who show up for like bee counts. There's all sorts of things like that that are involved in animals and counting and biodiversity, um, but very little with DNA sequencing technology right now, simply because it's too expensive. But as we, uh, you can expect if it costs $170, $170 today to do that bioweather map, that this time next year it might cost a dollar and 70 cents. Um, or you know maybe it's 20 bucks next year and a and dollar the year after that. And that's when things get really interesting in my opinion that it becomes um, consumer science in some way. It's almost uh, five o'clock, so we'll take one more question. Yeah, Peter. <clears throat> Your use of uh, crowds, Jason. Have you tied into Where's George? Yeah, that's a great idea. And uh, we were, for this bioweather map event that we're doing now, we, we were going to give away bonus points for anybody who submitted a dollar bill for Where's George. And, and they had a, if you don't, those who don't know, there's Where's George stamps that are out there that exist. And you can go type in the serial number of your dollar bill at a website like Where'sGeorge.com and track the geographic history of your dollar bill around the world. And so in theory, you could associate if you had thousands of dollar bills with geographic information about them, you could start to understand potential signatures in the things that live on dollar bills with where they've been uh, and understand the, the sort of forensic history uh, of a dollar bill based on that. Uh, but I think the real application there is, is going to be pollen. And uh, you can detect, understand the history of something by identifying and sequencing, you know, the pollen that lives on dollar bills, because you can actually potentially tr trace that all the way back to a regional varietal of a plant, um, which will also come into play in your home soon too, because all of those vitamins that you take that say that that has 50 exotic Chinese roots in them, that you've heard of half of them, you will actually be able to mash that up, send it off to the lab, and identify what's really in the pills that you're taking. And that'll be an interesting eye-opening day, I'm sure. That would mean there's no DNA. <laughs> <laughs> True, yeah. The roots do, though, right? Well, thank you both. I'd like to thank uh, Jason and Edward, and thank all of you. The video uh, cast should be up on the web in a few days. Thanks.